Marshall Suchet was quiet, unostentatious, and clever. But there aren't many stirring quotes or tales of daring do in his biography. He wasn't a relentless self-promoter like Ogeru or Murat. However, Marshal Suchet should be listed as one of the best commanders France ever produced. His battle record was a solid 15 wins against only five losses. During his first three years in the Spanish Peninsula War, with an army of less than 50,000 soldiers, he occupied three provinces and captured 77,000 enemy troops and 1,400 cannons. There was a period in Spain where he didn't lose a battle in four years, while almost every other marshal in Spain lost battle after battle. He was a brilliant strategist and a first-class administrator. And, most notably, he was the only one of Napoleon's marshals to win his baton as a result of his performance in Spain. Indeed, as Napoleon once remarked, quote, If I had two Suchets, I could have held all of Spain. End quote. Louis Gabriel Suchet was born on March 2nd, 1770, in Lyon, France. His father was a well-to-do silk merchant who was able to provide his son with a solid education growing up. In 1792, the young, handsome Suchet left his father's lucrative profession for something more exciting in the cavalry arm of the French military. Owing to the opportunity of rapid promotion for capable men in revolutionary France, Suchet was elevated to lieutenant colonel 16 months later. His education and natural talent allowed him to be promoted quickly. In 1793, he participated in the Siege of Toulon to eject the British from the French port. Here, he first came under the eye of his future emperor, Napoleon Bonaparte. During the siege, Suchet captured British General Charles O'Hara in a skirmish, who had the dubious distinction of surrendering to both George Washington in the Revolutionary War and Napoleon in the Siege of Toulon. For his efforts, Suchet was made governor of the city after the British fleet evacuated the harbor. By 1795, he was serving in the French army stationed in Italy, and participated in the victorious battle at Luano. The following year, he served under Napoleon yet again when the future emperor took command of the army of Italy. One of Napoleon's first acts upon taking command was to instill discipline in the poorly supplied troops. His soldiers hadn't been paid in months, and many units, including Suchet's, didn't have firearms. Napoleon addressed the poor state of his army, saying, quote, Misery has sanctioned in discipline. Without discipline, there is no victory. End quote. Suchet was listening, and from that moment forward, the future marshal insisted on strict discipline with his men. In return, he made sure his men were fed, supplied, and taken care of. Suchet was an excellent student of those capable men around him in the army of Italy, including future marshals Massena, Augereau, Marmont, Berthier, Victor, and Lang. Suchet served with distinction in the battles of Dago, Lodi, Borghetto, and Castiglione. He was later wounded at the Battle of Seria in September of 1796. Despite excellent performances in many of Napoleon's signature battles, the career of Suchet was a slow developing one. Other men around him, such as Marmont, Junot, and Victor, were promoted with greater speed and success than Suchet. He later joined Massena's division and served in the victories at Arcola and Rivoli. 
Although Suchet pined for advancement, he had to wait his turn in the queue. Everyone, from individual officers to sergeants to entire regiments, competed for the recognition of their dynamic general, Napoleon. Finally, in October 1797, the officers of General Massena's division were hosting a large dinner when Colonel Dupuy brought Suchet to Napoleon's table and said, quote, Well, General, when will you make our friend Suchet a full colonel? Napoleon replied, quote, Soon, we shall see about it. End quote. Dupuy took off one of his epaulets and placed it on Suchet's shoulder, saying, quote, By my almightiness, I make thee colonel. End quote. This bit of cheek actually worked as Napoleon instructed his chief of staff, Berthier, to write out Suchet's nomination for advancement. After serving in Switzerland, later under General Brune, Suchet was made Brigadier General. When Brun commanded the Army of Italy while Napoleon was away in Egypt, he made Suchet his chief of staff. His stellar performance in this role was noted by General Moreau, quote, Your general is one of the best staff officers in all the armies of France, end quote. In 1799, Suchet was made general of division a pretty impressive rise for a soldier who had just joined up seven years earlier. It was said that he had a cheerful smile and a kind word for everybody, and his tall, upright figure inspired confidence in officers and the troops alike. Suchet also had the gift of drafting clear, concise orders, which were easily understandable by his subordinates. In 1800, Suchet served as a general of 7,000 men under Massena's command. While Massena was bottled up in Genoa under siege by the Austrian army, Napoleon and his attack force were making their famous crossing of the Alps to fall upon the Austrian rearguard. Separated from Massena, Suchet did his best to keep the Austrian forces busy in his sector along the Var River. He succeeded in capturing 15,000 enemy troops, which helped Napoleon's winning efforts at the Battle of Marengo. Suchet's stalwart performance was praised by the government in Paris. Quote, the entire republic had its eyes fixed on this new passage of Thermopylae. You have been not less brave, but more successful than the Spartans. End quote. In 1803, Suchet was made a commander of a division in the corps of future Marshal Soult at the coastal camp of Boulogne. He was somewhat disappointed not to have his own corps to train and command, as General Marmont did. He was again chagrined by not being named amongst the original 18 Marshals of the Empire when the list came out in 1804, despite a superlative record as a general and administrator. But more opportunities to prove himself awaited Suchet in the near future. In the Ulm campaign against Austria, he commanded a division under Marshal Long. He later performed well in Napoleon's chess piece victory at Austerlitz, where he was rewarded with the Legion of Honor. He again fought with distinction in the 1806 battles against Prussia at Saalfeld, Jena, and Pultusk. In recognition of his services, Napoleon made him a Count of the Empire. Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available. 
With Spotify for podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for podcasters, I've really enjoyed the ease of use and the distribution ability of this platform. Around this time, Suchet married Honorine de Saint Joseph, who was the daughter of the rich mayor of Marseille. She was also a niece of Julie Clary, wife of Joseph Bonaparte. Thus, Suchet was sort of in the family of Napoleon, which brought him in the orbit, but not quite the inner circle of the French power brokers. Later, against military doctrine, Honorine joined her husband at the front in Spain. The emperor preferred the wives of the marshals to remain in Paris, but Honorine was determined to stay by her husband's side. It was also said that she set the fashion trends in the occupied city of Valencia, Spain. The couple had three children, one son and two daughters. Honorine survived her husband by 58 years, finally passing in 1884 at the age of 94. The Peninsula War in Spain had become a graveyard for French soldiers and the military reputations of several French marshals. Augereau, Victor, Marmont, Jordan, and Ney all foundered in Spain. Although Suchet never had more than 50,000 troops under his command, he succeeded through determination, insight, and great powers of organization. He first assisted in the siege of Saragossa, and then in 1809, he was given command of the poorly disciplined Third Corps in Spain, replacing the ineffective General Junot. In their first engagement under their new commander at the Battle of Alcanis, the French ran away from the attacking Spanish army. After this humbling defeat, Suchet saw that he had to fix many things with his army. Suchet also realized that the way to wear down the Spanish resistance was to capture fortresses while at the same time winning the hearts and minds of the Spanish population. He allowed the Spanish in his occupied territories of Catalonia and Aragon to govern themselves, manage their own budget, and levy taxes. The Spanish were also allowed to police themselves, run their own schools, and the clergy were treated with respect rather than suspicion. In other areas of Spain, French troops pillaged and looted the local population. Not so in Suchet's sector, as he wisely kept his troops in the background and promoted law and order. He made sincere proclamations to the Spanish, saying, quote, My troops will not impede your harvests, nor overcrowd your cities. They will live in the countryside, ready to protect you. End quote. Such was the safety in his area that individual French troops and the marshal's wife could walk safely through the streets without fear. By his energy and drive, Suchet made himself acquainted with every officer under his command, while his care for his soldiers also made him popular. His natural enthusiasm helped infuse his multinational force of French, German, Polish, and Italian troops with the spirit of Elan, which kept morale high. The Spanish civilians, who hated the French invaders, had a favorable opinion of Suchet with the general opinion, quote, he is a just man, end quote. After refitting his troops with equipment, food, and pay, his second engagement, the Battle of Maria against the Spanish, was a resounding victory. Suchet's 11,000 troops routed a larger army of 20,000, inflicting 4,500 casualties and capturing 20 cannons. In April 1810, Suchet again beat the Spanish at the Battle of Lerida. This started a string of victories as fortress after fortress fell.
fell to Suchet's marauders. His methods of warfare could be brutal, but they were successful nonetheless. Suchet also drove the guerrilla fighters out of Aragon, which improved local commerce and agriculture alike. Farmers and merchants were able to get their goods to market and increase revenues, and as the saying goes, a rising tide lifts all boats. Suchet's tax revenues were enough to get his soldiers paid on a regular basis, which was another rare feat amongst the marshals in Spain. He neutralized the guerrillas by respecting the lives, property, and religious practices of the local populations. Freed up from pursuing guerrillas, he could focus on defeating the Spanish armies. His troops next captured the forts at Tortosa, San Felipe, Tarragona, Sagunto, and Valencia. Suchet had a calculated system for each siege. First, he set his siege lines, then beat back any forces trying to relieve the siege. Next, the fortress was overrun, and finally, he built the fort back up as a base of operations for his next advance. Suchet's patience and positive energy imbued his men with an air of invincibility. Meanwhile, the Spanish armies fought with grim determination, but morale sank lower with each captured fort. The May 1811 siege at Tarragona was a brutal affair, but it was to earn the 41-year-old Suchet his long-awaited marshal's baton. Napoleon promised it to him beforehand if the port city was captured. Suchet used his textbook strategy of setting up his siege lines towards the city. His troops then beat off all attempts by the British to reinforce the city. After two months, the city was finally captured by a French surprise attack. The French suffered 4,300 casualties in the assault, and after the city fell, atrocities were visited upon the surrendering Spanish troops and civilians, including 450 women and children. The French troops were angry about their losses in the assault, despite Suchet's vain attempts to stop reprisals. The marshal noted afterwards, quote, their uncurbed fury would listen to nothing, end quote. One historian noted that Suchet's marshal's baton was one with a bloody hand. After that, Suchet and his men went on to seize the fort of Oropesa. In October 1811, Suchet was again victorious at the Battle of Saguntum but he was severely wounded in the shoulder by a musket ball. The injury prevented him from riding a horse. In 1812, Napoleon lavished further rewards on his old friend, making him Duke of Albufera. The emperor also sent one of his personal surgeons to Spain to treat the marshal's shoulder, and he was able to ride again within two months. But as the saying goes, he who giveth can also taketh away. After Napoleon's disastrous Russian invasion, many regiments of the Suchets were transferred to Germany and France to hold off the invading allies. Realizing that he would be getting no reinforcements, Suchet treated his men like gold and thus ensured they had proper clothing, food, and hospital care. In the meantime, the British, under the Duke of Wellington, were successful in defeating other French armies in Spain under Marshals Massena and Marmont. Marshal Soult did his best to retrieve the situation, but it was difficult to stem the tide with the reduced manpower of the French. After Marshal Jordan and King Joseph's loss at Vittoria, the writing was on the wall. Suchet slowly retreated back over the border into France. During his time in Spain, the marshal had defeated two attempted British seaborne invasions of his territories. Such was their respect for Suchet 
that neither Wellington nor his subordinates wanted anything to do with attacking Suchet when the French forces were retreating back to their homeland. As he retreated into France, Suchet met with the returning Spanish king, Ferdinand, who Napoleon had forced to abdicate his throne years earlier. The Spanish king thanked Suchet for his benevolence while in Spain. By the time Napoleon abdicated his throne in 1814, the consummate tactician Suchet was able to extricate most of his troops from Spain without surrendering them. When King Louis XVIII and the Bourbon royals took over command of France, Suchet remarked, quote, I only want to serve France, and I will serve the Bourbons, end quote. He was made a peer of France by the new government. In 1815, after Napoleon's escape from Elba, Suchet once again rallied to his old leader, whom he had not seen since 1808. The emperor greeted him kindly, quote, Marshal Suchet. You have grown greatly in reputation since last we met. End quote. Napoleon dispatched him to Lyon for yet another independent command. Should he have been with Napoleon in his Waterloo campaign? It is a question that many historians have debated. But it must be remembered that in the previous year, Augereau's lackluster performance at Lyon, along the southeastern border of France, had greatly distressed Napoleon and cost him his throne. And thus, in 1815, he sent an independent commander he could trust. With his usual steady performance at the front lines, Suchet routed a Piedmontese army and then an Austrian force in June. But these victories were insignificant after the loss at Waterloo. After Napoleon's second and final abdication, Suchet attempted to help his brother Marshal Ney escape persecution. He offered him money, a passport, and an escort, despite the danger from the returning royals. Unfortunately, Ney was captured and eventually shot by firing squad. For this brave act, Suchet was struck from the list of peers of France by the returning Bourbons, and forcibly retired to his estates. There, he worked on his memoirs and wrote of his experiences in the Peninsula War and what he expected from his men, saying, quote, The French soldier distinguishes himself by a brilliant quality which no other soldier in Europe possesses in so eminent a degree. He has a soul-stirring spirit within him, his bravery is not that of a mere automation. End quote. In 1826, the marshal passed quietly in near obscurity. So esteemed was he in Spain that upon learning of his death, priests in Saragossa held a mass in remembrance of him. On St. Helena, Napoleon was asked who his best generals were. He replied, saying, quote, that is difficult to say. Of the generals of France, I give the preference to Suchet. Before his time, Massena was the first. Suchet, Clausel, and Girard are, in my view, the best French generals. End quote. He later added, quote, Suchet was a man whose mind and character increased wonderfully. End quote. I believe we will finish up on this point. Join us next time when we discuss another old friend of Napoleon's, Marshal Massena, whose career followed a different path, starting high, but slowly declining over the course of the empire. Thanks for listening.